take your Bible and turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, pick up verse 5. It's good to have our visitors with us again. And thank you for coming. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Through the book of Hebrews, uh, I've been studying the priesthood a lot, different things, examples of the priesthood, how the Christian should what the priesthood means to the Christian and how as spiritual priest we should be like a priest and the examples that was given in the Old Testament of what a priest should be like. If you take your Bible and you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 5 it says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I have two messages that I preach on the spiritual priesthood of the believer. First of all, are you a good priest? I preached that two weeks ago. Next one is the one I like to preach today, offering spiritual sacrifices. As I've been studying the book of Hebrews, I realized I could probably come up with eight more have ten messages on this. I mean, there's so much in it and uh, that we can learn from, that we can apply to ourselves. I'd like to preach on spiritual sacrifices. To be a good priest, just recapping the last message two weeks ago, a good priest should be a consecrated priest, one that's set apart. He should be clothed with righteousness. He should have a burden for loss, the lost in his heart. He should be anointed and he should be a source of contact to the world for God. Those are all things and attributes we as Christians should have if we're going to be a good priest for God. Amen? Spiritually, you should be a priest and a good priest for God. I'm talking spiritual application here. Says you're a holy nation, a spiritual priesthood. The next thing is you should you have a certain type of sacrifices that one should offer. And uh, a sacrifice is giving something to God that costs you. I want to go to the Lord in prayer. I'd say turn to Second Samuel twenty four. Well, I'm in prayer, but why don't you wait till after I pray, then turn there. <laughs> okay. It's kind of like growling at the kids because they're not bowing their heads at <laughs> dinner table. Uh, second, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll be with this message. I pray that you'll bless it. pray that you'll wash me in your precious blood. I pray that this message will be used by you to help us as we realize that there's things that we can put on the altar of sacrifice that pleases You. That's a sweet smell and savor to You that brings You honor and brings You glory. And it's for our benefit to help us draw closer to You. I pray that we'll look at these sacrifices and that we'll realize we need to apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. First of all, I'd like you to take your Bible and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24. I want you to pick up verse 21. I want you to see something about a sacrifice that kind of defines what it is. Something that gives an importance about a sacrifice. Okay? There's different types of sacrifices. So we were looking in Sunday school. There's a free will sacrifice and then there's the required sacrifice. But a sacrifice costs. Has a cost to it. Look at 2 Samuel 24. Pick up verse 20. It says, And Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Aruna said, Where? For is my lord the king come to his servant? David said to buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the lord that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Aruna said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up 
what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be the oxen for burnt sacrifice, and threshing instruments, and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Aruna, as a king give unto the king. And Aruna said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me, what? Nothing. So David bought the threshing floor in the auction for fifty shekels of silver. David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. Now uh, the simple thing here is to point out a sacrifice should cost. There's a cost to a sacrifice. You say, but Jesus Christ was the sacrifice for our sins and that's a free gift. Amen, it is. But it still costs. That costs God. That cost Jesus Christ. That came at a very great cost. It cost someone suffering. And uh, us, to be good priests, we have to offer some sacrifices. Those sacrifices should cost us. You know, a lot of times people never grow in their Christianity. They never grow in the Lord or come closer to the Lord because to follow the Lord both as a disciple and as a better Christian, it's going to cost you. Uh, when Jesus Christ talks about disciples, He tells His disciples they have, they have to leave father, and mother, house, wife. Now, doesn't He tell them that? I mean, uh, this one disciple is going to follow Him. He says, let me go bury my father first. He says, let the dead bury their dead. It's kind of a rude thing to say to somebody. You know? <laughs> That'd be hard to accept. Somebody told me that. I mean, I mean, if I was put in an application to be a pastor in the church and my mother died, and I said, hey, i got to go do a funeral first. And they told me, let the dead bury their dead. I said, no, you know what? Find somebody else. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> hey man, that kind of would be our attitude. But... uh but the ideal is, if you're going to follow the Lord, it's going to cost you. There's a cost that we have to pay. And a sacrifice requires a cost. Now, there's some sacrifices as a Christian that we should offer as good priests. Number one, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Here's the first sacrifice. We all start with this one. If you're going to be a good priest, this ought to be the first sacrifice that you present. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I, that doesn't say you need to put your body on an altar to be burnt. That's saying a living sacrifice. Present yourself a living sacrifice. In other words, give God your body. Your body's His. When we get saved, we're supposed to crucify the flesh. Amen? The flesh is supposed to be dead unto sin. For your, the first sacrifice you should make is that of the old man, the flesh. You need to sacrifice it on the altar. Put that flesh down. You know, the problem with that flesh is he gets, keeps jumping off the altar. I mean, a living sacrifice is a little bit more difficult. you got to hog tie that thing <laughs> so it doesn't get away. <laughs> I mean, not all living sacrifices is like Isaac. Isaac's going up the hill. Where, where's the... I mean, I see the wood, I see the fire. That boy was thinking, man. I mean, the wheels in his head was turned. But where's the sacrifice? God shall prophesy himself a lamb. Like, I'll bet Isaac starts sweating. Boy, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? You know. But uh, you got to take the flesh. That flesh doesn't like to be on the altar. It's going to fight. There's going to be a fight going on. It doesn't want that. I. Uh, 
I mean, not, not all living sacrifices is like Japheth's daughter. Oh, give me a couple months to go roam the hills. And then, yeah, I'll never come back. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's the norm. I, I mean, there's some different messages with Japheth's daughter too. I don't believe Japheth was right in that one. You ever notice that God kept silent through that whole thing? God never told him to do it. He just kept silence. Don't think that the silence of God is God's approval. Man, you get to Jeremiah and he says it never even crossed my God said it never even crossed my mind for you to put your sons and daughters through the fire. That tells me that what Japheth did was out of his own ignorance. Now, his motive may have been right, but it was still an ignorant move. And uh, we're supposed to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Something where it's God's. We give it over to God. God can have it. You know what that means? That means everything you do with your body has to meet God's approval. If it's His. Oh boy, we could go on there all day long. I mean, we could park there and never... Does what you dress, is that God's approval? Did you dress your body according to God's approval? I mean, I, oh, I could preach standards on this one if I wanted to. I could just go, go, and go. You present your body's living sacrifice. Well, did you take your body where God wanted it to be? It's His. No, I took it over here. Is that where God wanted it to be? Did you put in your body what needed to be put in it? What God wanted? It's His body. It's not yours. Did you do with your body what God wanted? Now look what it says. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Here, God wants your body to be holy. Not with all them crazy tattoos and body piercings and God knows what with it. He wants you to present it as a living sacrifice. You know what that tells me? That tells me that the things that I do with my body has to go through God's approval first because it's His. Boy, won't that change the way you live. Very few Christians will look at it that way. Very few times do we ever stop and even think about that. Here, here's the one. Have you sacrificed your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord? And then you're going through life and then you do a sin or you do something else. You realize you just took something that doesn't belong to you and used it in an inappropriate manner. You feed. Let me tell you something. If you give something to me and I put it in my garage, let's say it's a car. You give me a car. You say, you know what? I'm giving you this. This is yours. Here's the keys and everything. But you keep a key. And here a year goes down the road. I've got registered tag. I've been using it for a year and stuff. And you show up. And you take that car and you go rob a bank. And then you go park it back. But you left my license plate on it. You park it back in my garage. Because you kept the key to the car. Cops are going to show up. And they're going to say... This car was used in bank robbery. You robbed the bank. Like, oh no, I didn't rob the bank. Well, we, your car was there. It was a getaway car. I'm going to be a little upset with you. <laughs> I mean, that's a, I mean, hey man, I'm going to be a little bit upset. I mean, you just took something that at that point was mine 
destroyed my reputation, got me in trouble doing something that was wrong and that was wicked. My name is plastered on that car with that license plate. It has my backing. And that's what we do every time to God when we take our body and we sin. Ever think about that? Gives it a little bit of a different view. And then God, we just expect, God, oh, that's okay. that's okay. We expect God to say, oh, that's okay. I mean, if you gave me the excuse, well, I gave you the car. I can use it as I want. Oh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Okay? It doesn't work that way with God either. I'll tell you, sometimes God might do something with our body that isn't exactly according to our approval. When you give somebody a car and he decides, you know what, I'm going to teach my son how to drive with it. He's 14. That car may be in rough shape after it gets done. You can sit there and say, man, I gave you that car, but I didn't give it to you for that purpose. You weren't supposed to use it that way. You got dents all over it. You, got, you messed it all up. You say, yeah, but it's not your car anymore. You gave it to me. I can do with it as I want. But boy, when God puts us through some things, we don't really feel like God's using our body the way it's supposed to be used. Paul in 2 Corinthians 11.24 talks about some of the ways... God used His body after it was presented as a living sacrifice. It says, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. You'd think God would take care of that body a little bit better, wouldn't you? Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwright. A night and a day have I been in the deep. Hey Lord, I'm going to present my body a living sacrifice, but you need to take good care of it. You know, that's, uh, Lord had plans with that body. Matter of fact, when he saved Paul, he says, he's a chosen vessel for me. God had plans with him. He was going to use the body. You know, you can always tell the toolbox of the guy that is a showboat mechanic. He may fix on one fix one car a month. That toolbox is shiny, perfect shape. You look at my tools at work. Oh man. They're used and abused. <laughs> I mean, they get used. They're not for show. God gets your body. It may not be for show. It may be for a use. Maybe for a use. Our physical bodies need to be a sacrifice. You know the other thing that I see as a sacrifice that's given to God? A broken heart. A broken heart. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms 51, 16 through 17. Psalms chapter 51, verse 16 and 17. The Bible says, For thou desirest not sacrifice, or else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. You know what the second sacrifice you ought to give? A heart that is broken. Now what does that mean? A broken heart is one that is under subjection to the Lord. Now, I'll, I'll give you this illustration. How many of you have ever had horses here? You ever had horses? Ever rode a horse? Okay. If you've ever ridden a horse, the first thing you have to do when you get on that horse, a lot of horses are this way, that horse knows a new rider is on him. And you know what he does? He tests the reins. 
And one of the easiest ways to get that out of that horse's system is when he starts testing that range, you take that rein and you put that horse's nose in his rear end and you make him do circles. And then you let him up and if he acts again, you do it again until he quits testing the reins. That's when he breaks. Now, the cowboys break the horse, and I've never broken a horse from a wild spirit to a broken horse. I've never done that. All right? now, I imagine they could illustrate this a whole lot better. But until that horse is broken, it will not submit to the one that's riding it. It has to be broken. A broken heart is not a killed spirit. You don't kill the spirit of the horse. You just break it where it's no longer full of pride and want and do its own thing. God's going to break you. Allow Him to break your heart. And give it to Him. And many a times, God has to put you through something that you do not like before your heart is broken in contact. Am I? He'll do it. He's going to break you. There's something about our nature until God breaks us, we do things our own way. A broken heart sits there and says, Lord, everything I've ever tried doesn't work. I want you to do it all. That's what a broken heart does. I've done it my way. It it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Lord, if you don't do it, it can't be done. That's a broken heart. A heart that says, I'll do it this way. I I don't need that. I'll do it this way. I'll do that. Doing everything is on it. It ain't broken yet. It ain't broken. And uh, sometimes... We need to offer God a broken and contrite heart. Number three, we need to offer Him praise and thanks. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, pick up verse 13. It says, Let us go forth therefore unto Him without the camp, bearing His reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By Him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. Say, how is praising God and giving Him thanks a sacrifice? I'll I'll put it this way. My wife is diagnosed with cancer. She goes through the surgery with cancer. She's laying in the bed and we're talking to her and you know what she's always saying to the people that come in and work on her and suck her blood out stab her and do all that chemo stuff oh God's good God's always good God's good I'll tell you she she went through that thing well she went through it well you know what the people saw they saw God carrying her through and they saw something different that's why God gave it to her and not me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I got a little, you know, I always sit there and say, I'm no Job, but I got a little bit of Job on me. And me. Job starts, I curse the day I was born and <laughs> let me die. You know, <laughs> she's uh, trying to do the carrot juice thing so it don't come back and give her a bunch of vitamins. I say, I'll do it with you, honey. I still got my little eight ounce carriages about that much. I got to finish when I get home. <laughs> <I> still, <laughs> and she's drinking these glasses. And I'm like, I'll, I'll take it. I'll do it with you. Give me, I give her this little cup. <laughs> she's like, all right, you give me that cup. I'll drink it. <laughs> right. but, uh, but how often you praise the Lord when you're going through something bad or give them thanks. And everything give thanks. 
For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What about when the baby died? What about when the kids are sick? What about when the accident happens and you're crippled? Boy. I remember I went to a nursing home one day. Me and my visitation partner, we went in there. They had canceled visitation and kids, young people were going out to a nursing home, so we went with them. We walked into this nursing home and we went and we visited this guy. Here's this guy, he'd been crippled from birth, laying in bed. Parents couldn't take care of him, so they stuck him in this nursing home. Bed sores because they had to be rolled over and stuffed and patched. We get in and this guy was a Christian. He was saved. And uh, Lord giving him an extra amount of grace. He's sitting there. They'd come up and meet him. And that guy did nothing but for about the next 30 minutes praise God. He praised God about the great care they gave him. He praised God about the great food they gave him. Didn't look that great. <laughs> he, I mean, it was nothing but praises. I, I'd been grumbling and complaining about some things I'd been going through. I walked out of that nursing home after dealing with that guy, trying to comfort him and getting nothing but praise back from him. There was, I mean, he had the victory. I walked out of that thing, I felt that tall. Felt that tall. I said, now that guy, that guy knows how to live a victorious life in Christ Jesus. He, he's got something, I, I mean, he, he's got to a degree in his Christianity, I have to say I haven't arrived yet there. I learned something that day. I learned something that some people that are full of the Spirit of God will give thanks and praises at all times. Every time I start grumbling, that's a reminder to me. I mean, I... I'm a grumbler. I'm a complainer. I admit it. I, I sometimes I, I, I start grumbling and complaining. I want to put my sledgehammer through the windshield of a car. I, mean, I have to resist. No. You, do you speak your mind every time when something goes? No, I don't. Otherwise, I'd have no testimony at work. <laughs> I mean, that's a. <laughs> Oh, speak your mind. No, you don't want me to speak my mind all the time. That flesh is rising. I mean, it has words to say that is just not appropriate. I've always said being a mechanic and being a preacher are a contrast and interest. I mean, that, that they don't go together. You can't be both. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, but I mean, you ever give God thanks for everything? Now, it's not going right. He's sitting there working on I mean, you fire up the engine and that you just got done rebuilding and last about two minutes and then da -da 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 whoops. I, I, I replaced a brand new engine once on Eco Diesel. It was about an uh, $11,000 engine. I got, there was one bolt that was missing. Is an intake bolt. And I couldn't find that, so I found one that's similar and replaced it. I fired that thing up. I found my bolt. It got found down the hole of that intake. Brand new engine. Thank God it was under warranty. <laughs> Chrysler, I had to pay for that one, <laughs> but I had to redo that job. That was about a three-day job. Oh, man. I did not sit there and say, praise God, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. No, that wasn't my answer. <laughs> I mean, and everything, give thanks for this will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know, the, the victorious Christian life is when you can look at stuff like that and say, okay. And she's been saying this all the time. 
The Lord is doing something. And instead of seeing your trouble, you're looking to see what God is doing. And everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do we live the victorious Christian life where we can give a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving? And here, here's the one that is the forbidden one. The sacrifice of giving. The sacrifice of giving. Philippians chapter 4, verse 18 through 19 says, But I have all and abound, I am full and have received of Aphrodite the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know what that is? That's given to someone. That's a sacrifice. Giving your hard-earned money to someone else without any expectation of anything in return is a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. And we know when it comes to financial stuff, sometimes the sacrifice is more or less with people, but a lot of times it depends on what they have. We learn that when Jesus Christ is watching the poor woman's might, He puts it in, He says, in my eyes, she gave more than anyone else. That sacrifice is judged in God's eyes. But what's it meant for? It's meant to be a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Amen? It's meant for His eyes. His eyes alone. And I get, that's one reason I like to do the uh, box in the back for the offering. Is we, we don't, I'm not against passing the plate. I don't do that because of the conviction, conviction that I have that passing a plate is wrong. I don't believe passing a plate is wrong. But... Your giving is between you and God and God sees it. And it's pleasing to Him. You don't have to please me with your gift. I always have said it like this, and this is probably a terrible attitude for a preacher to have. If you love your money, keep it. I don't want it. <laughs> I mean, that's, a, that's probably a per- terrible attitude for a preacher to have. But I mean, uh, you get the point. It's not for me. If you give, then give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. And, uh, it, but that's, that's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. You, you don't believe it's a sacrifice? Well, what could you use that money for? I had a lost guy one time hounding me when I was a young man. He knew I was religious and been witnessing to him. And it was... I, uh, over the years, I finally was able to lead this guy to the Lord. And it took me four years of him doing nothing but giving me a hard time. I, he gave me a hard time. And uh, he gave me such a hard time, and he was giving me a hard time about giving one. He, was, he wanted me to get this. He goes, you could buy. He says, if you'd quit giving all your money to the church, you could buy this, this, and this, and me having fun with us. And he talked like snowmobile or a gun or something. I don't know what it was. I, and the devil come along and sit there and said to me, you know, he's right. If you had all that money you put in the plate, you could have bought this. You know how much you could buy with that? That's a temptation by the devil. Yeah, but you don't know how much the Lord gave you because of that either. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, I, I'll say today, then I was young. Today I'll say what the old preachers used to always say, you can, I'll give God. Now that's not Scripture, but by experience, I'll say that. You can't outgive God. Now, you just can't do it. And... Uh, and he'd sit there and tempt me like that. And you'd sit there and look at that. Yeah, it's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. You sit there and think about all the stuff you could do with that money and stuff. 
Let me tell you something. When it comes to sacrificing to God, it's to be pleasing to God. And you can't, you don't want to go through life without God's blessing and being pleased with you. The benefit of God's pleasure on your life is more than any sacrifice that you've ever given to Him. Number six. And this is the last one I'm going to hit. This is the last sacrifice. It says in uh, Romans chapter 15 through 16. Actually, let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Last sacrifice I want to talk about is your time. Is your time. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yet, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of faith, I joy and rejoice with you all, for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. It says, offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. Your service of faith is a sacrifice. In other words, you're doing something for God. Your service. You serve it. That's a sacrifice. What's it a sacrifice of? And in my opinion, the most valuable thing in this world, your time. Time has a value that has a high price. Boy, it takes a long time to figure that one out. You start, once you start figuring out how valuable your time is, you start regulating your time a certain way. Time has a value. Service requires time. Will you give God some of your time? And you said time doing, time doing whatever He would ask you to do. Time and service. Time has a great value. And, uh, you know, you know uh, if people give, a lot of times we would rather give money than give time. I, I know I'm that way a lot of times. Here, here I'll, 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 I'd rather pay you to fix your car than fix your car myself. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a, I just don't have that kind of time. It's the time. And sometimes at work, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll look at a job that's gone disaster, and I'll just tell the service right, you know what you ought to do? You ought to just give this guy his money back and ship that thing to someone else. Because there's no way we can take and make enough money off this job to profit us, and you better just count your loss and let it go than to deal with it. car belongs in the junkyard. You, you can't fix it for what it's worth. And you'll never get paid for your time. Time's money. Uh, we, uh, commission mechanics, we look at it like this. We're, because you get paid according to not how long you're there, but how much the job pays. Well, that motivates you. And you look at it and you sit there and say, time is money. Don't waste my time. And uh, that's the attitude we get. And it's not always a good attitude to have. I actually think that commission pay makes poor mechanics. Because they're doing stuff too fast. And uh, working through it and they're not taking the time that they need to do the job right. Now that's that's why your car always comes back to the dealership after you right after you pick it up, because he he rushed. <laughs> I mean that's, um, and a hundred other reasons why it might do that, <laughs> but uh, but that's what you run into. Time is a sacrifice. Only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That sacrifice of time that you give to God actually is the best thing you can do with it. 
It's the only way. There's only one way to save time, and that's by giving it to the eternal God. Because if you don't give it to God, that time is gone and wasted forever. Time can only be you saved by giving it to God. You can save money, but you can't save time. Time comes and it goes. Only what gives you give to God will amount to anything. All right, let's uh, let's have a song of invitation. Are you a good priest, and do you give spiritual sacrifices? Here's uh, these are some spiritual sacrifices. I'll say as a Christian, there's some sacrifices you need to find that you can give to God. I, I think to have a victorious Christian life and the right Christian life, you ought to give all these sacrifices. All of them. Not just one. And the way you give them will be different. Your, your time is used differently than my time. God will use your time in a different way. Do you give them your body as a living sacrifice? Do you give them praise and thanks as a sacrifice? Do you give them your time? What have you given to God? I'll tell you, you'll never outgive Him. He's already given you more than you can ever give back. So do you sacrifice? Alright. Huh? 342.